everyone, I'm Carleen Jackson. And I'm Zoe England. Thanks for listening to Marketing Decanted for SMEs, the podcast from Cloud9 Insight created to be an essential guide to small business marketing. On today's episode, we're talking to Luke Quilter. He is the CEO of Sleeping Giant Media, Giant Campus, and the Spark Agency. With over 15 years' experience in digital marketing, Luke finds an opportunity to share his experience with other businesses, aiming to make them giant through the powers of digital and business strategy. Luke joins us today to discuss the emergence of virtual brand and how businesses can strengthen theirs in a post-COVID world. Thanks for joining and enjoy this episode. Hi Zoe, how are you today? Hi Colleen, yeah I'm really good, how are you? I'm very good. So today on our episode we've got Luke Quilter, I'm really excited to have him here with us. He's the CEO and co-founder of Sleeping Giant Media and he runs a, a multimedia, sort of multi-award winning in fact digital marketing agency and he is working with us on a few projects at the minute. Um, so so that's really exciting. He's working on our first PPC campaign. There's also a bunch of training. And uh, so, Luke, are you, are you, how are you doing? Hi there. Yeah, well, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Yeah, just to sort of expand on um, sort of who we are, what we do. Um, so we, we're Sleeping Giant Media. We've been around now for 12 years, and we focus on getting more relevant traffic to our clients' websites through paid search, SEO, and social media. Um, and I've been spending the last kind of eight-ish months since the start of the first lockdown um, trying to help businesses to obviously pivot, adapt, change to the world that we're kind of that we've been thrust into, and obviously the world that we will reach as well into the into the new year as as habits and behaviours have changed. So, yeah, really excited to be here, and thanks very much for having me. That sounds great, Luke. So, um, tell us a bit more about what you do in terms of what what's your superpower or what's your specialism in terms of what your you and your business do. Yeah. So. Superpower. Wow. I'm not sure what quite, quite, I don't know if I classify it as that, but um, we, we really, tr- I mean, I think there's a lot of agencies out there, obviously. And, and um, you know, I think they would all claim to do, um, you know, to do a great job for, for customers and clients. But I think it's, it's easy said, but much harder to actually deliver. So I think w- when we set the business up 12 years ago, it was focused around trying to combine both the sort of the technical understanding for, uh, for search marketing and, and social media, which is, which in itself is very, very technical, but Delivering it in a way which is understandable, um, which helps people to um, develop their skills as part of that process as well. So it's combining the technical and customer service. And I think if that could be classified as a superpower, and I, I'm going to say it is because I think, um, as I said, it's very, very easy to say and much, much harder to deliver in, sure. in practice consistently, um, which is, yeah, I think, partly why we've got to where we are because we've been able to do that for, um, you know, for that time period. So, so marketing, in our experience, is a very broad area. And one of the things that we chatted about recently was the fact that more and more of us are having to be virtually perfect um, and thrust in front of cameras. It, mm. I remember it wasn't it was only a year ago that if you suggested to a client of having a, a video sales call, their mic wouldn't work or their camera wasn't working. I think they're probably just a bit camera shy, actually. And I know you've been working with a lot of businesses to help them with creating that virtual perfection with their sales team and other client facing people and so it would be great if we could um share a little bit more um insight uh with those listening around sort of what does that mean um for your clients yeah absolutely yes yeah, it's, it's a strange one isn't it i mean we've, we've probably all had the technology um or most of us you know in our laptops and and um you know around our offices in terms of the ability to actually communicate remotely but you know I think pre-COVID, there was obviously a lot of people preferred the face-to-face meetings, which you know I can understand, and, and obviously still do for for a lot of you know a lot of um, different meetings. It's better to meet face to face, but we've then been kind of thrust into this this world where obviously we couldn't do that, and suddenly we had to then use technology to communicate. And I think there's been a realization. A lot of people have gone, you know what? It's actually not as bad as they as they thought it might have been. So I think. That, you know, that, as I said, it doesn't fully replace the face-to-face. Um, but I think for some meetings and for some um, purposes, it, it can be as effective and potentially, you know, a massive time saver because you're not having to travel and, and and do all those sorts of things. And yeah, I think probably a lot of us have uh, 
have experienced the back-to-back Zoom calls throughout the day and you're like, oh, God, that's, you know, it's quite tiring, but it's yeah. also very, very productive. Um, I think that the problem that businesses have found is obviously they've been forced into it and a lot of them have, have just kind of switched on their cameras, they've switched on their mics and they've just kind of gone, right, this is me. And I think that actually that they need to realize that now that is a channel, that is the route to market that obviously once was your office and, you know, we all made our offices, most of us made our offices look um, really nice and impressive so that someone walks through the door and they have a very good first impression. The difficulty now is obviously the first impression is what they see through the camera. And obviously, if you've got a messy background, if you've got poor lighting, if your sound doesn't work, if your camera's at a funny angle, pointing straight up your nostrils, down on the top of your head, <laughs> you know, those are the, those are the things that people will, will see. And, and obviously, yes, there's an element of authenticity. People want to know that, you know, we, we've all been, as I said, thrust into this situation. So we're never going to be, you know, perfect to be set up, but there's, there's, there's wins there. There's opportunities to, Try to up your virtual game so that you you leave a, a, a good first impression and that then sets you up for uh, potentially a more productive and beneficial sales call or team meeting or, or whatever it might be. And, and, and I think that's what we've been trying to talk to businesses about as, as you know, one of the things that we've been talking about. But that's something we've been talking about to try to say, guys, it's not just an IT thing now. It's, it's a marketing thing. We've, we've got to have a think about what what we look like, how we come across and, and how that happens in a virtual environment because it's, it's potentially a very important touch point for businesses to, to communicate with their clients and their teams. And those touch points obviously, you know, lead to either positive or negative outcomes. So trying to influence in a way that ends in a positive one is, is something that's obviously really important for businesses to do in the virtual environment. Yeah, so that, that's, really, that's really interesting what you've touched on there, Luke. So um, I know certainly here at Cloud9, um, we've been doing quite a lot of uh, personal brand within the leadership team um, just to understand you know, how we're coming across and, and also how we can be seen as, as thought leaders and having those roles, um, the sort of marketing hat, I guess, outside of the marketing department. So what's your sort of view on that and, and any sort of trends around that that you're seeing? Yeah, I think it's really, really important. I think... Um what the pandemic's done is it's 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 humanized everything a bit more and i think mm. um you know the big businesses that have been operating um in a very corporate way haven't really fared so well i think they've, they've kind of um they haven't shown their personality and, and i think that's to a degree been you know felt by people as quite cold and i think that's always been the case so i'd always I'd, you know i always would suggest that businesses try to bring more personality because um because i think you know people buy from people i think it's really important but i think that the the pandemic has accelerated that trend where people wanted to see faces and they wanted to see people and they wanted mm. to know that that people are you know are there taking care of them and thinking uh, behaving appropriately towards their customers to their staff etc because it is such a humanizing event that that's you know that's affected everybody across the world pretty much so i think it's it's accelerated that trend and i think businesses moving similar to yourself where you're, you're focusing on uh, people your team thought leadership is, is a great place to go because i think that that's you know that's really great for, for businesses to see that to see you in that light to say right they're, they're leading the way they're focusing on their staff their team in, in, in a positive way um because it will it will humanize the business it will mean that actually they can go you know what i trust them they're doing a good job and i think from a marketing perspective that's that's really powerful um, and I think that the, the virtual world has enabled us to do that. So, you know, we, we were previously talking about, you know, getting more involved with social media um, to our clients and, and talking about video content, doing more of that. You know, pre-pandemic, it's always been, you know, that's something that we, we think is really important. But it, I can't stress the importance of it enough right now. It's really, really important, more so than it was before, to, to have that face to, to kind of get out there but let, and let people see you as, as, a, as a human and, and not be that face, you know, that faceless corporation, that kind of cold business that, that doesn't necessarily care. And I think that, you know, personal branding, thought leadership is, a, is, is the most effective way um, to, to do that if you, if you can, and certainly in the B2B space. Yeah, it's been a, a, a great investment internally. I think we've had to also include some social media training because part of getting your uh, brand out there is through through this people's social media as well but i think what we were trying to do is to just empower you could say the team mm. to know that they too had a voice and the thought leadership and to show them how to do that because there's only so many hours in the day uh no matter how many marketing people and there often is a, an expression which is everyone's in marketing aren't they 
Um, so having that sort of um, employee ambassador sort of training has has really helped with that. And and your yeah. point about um, having a human face to your business, I think one thing that we've all craved more than anything, especially during lockdowns, is that human connection. And I guess being able to virtually meet people um, has probably helped with that as well and build on those relationships. But different than the norm, how would you, would you if you were working with clients and, and helping them adjust to this new norm, what, what would you say are the main differences and things that they need to th- really think about? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think you, you touched upon some some really kind of good points there. I think it's um, you know, some of the big big changes. I think, as you said, it, it's um, people want to have that human interaction, and, and obviously, you can't do it, you know, in the real world as as easily um, at the moment, certainly. And so, the virtuals are kind of the best um, alternative for for a lot of businesses. I think, as I said, it, it's thinking about what people see in that that kind of that camera, and it's like, you know, if you've got. A really messy background. Um, if you if you're wearing a really kind of uh, casual T-shirt, you know they, these are things that you, you know you wouldn't do in in that real world. You know, and I think sometimes we just got to remind ourselves that that may have been okay at the start of the pandemic when everyone was just you know to a degree in the panic stage of of the curve. And we did a lot around the change curve. They were in the kind of that you know just trying to simply survive, adapt, and, and kind of work out what on earth is going on. Um, and I think it was okay then, but I think we now will be in a world where actually this is part of our normality. Like we are now, you know, used to this technology and therefore we will probably, when we have meetings go, do we have to do that face to face? Okay. Well, that'll save me about four hours of travel time. So, you know what, I'd rather spend that time with my family in the evening or, or whatever it might be. I think the work balance, life balances will, will be, have been called into question more than ever uh, for a lot of us who've uh, worked remotely, um, <clears throat> that weren't previously working remotely. And so I just think we have to think about what that means for, you know, how we come across in, in those virtual interactions, whether that's, um, you know, just looking at your, um, you know, what you wear, <laughs> certainly on the top part, at least. And so that that's what, you know, that's what's going to come through and as your, your kind of first impression. So that I think is something the businesses have to consider for their workforce. And, and you mentioned it just before there that I'm not, when I talk about social media, I'm not necessarily just talking about the company profile and the company social media accounts. It's about empowering. It's about working with your team to show them the benefit and the importance of um, social media. Firstly, for their own, you know, for their own reasons, you know, their, their future careers, etc. But also that the reach that you get if you empower your employees to to work on social media is much more significant than what your company might get independently. So I think it's trying to make sure that you, you know, you have a strategy, a social media strategy that engages your employees to. Um, to 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 you know to interact to comment um, with you know within <laughs> within rules to a degree um, on social media because that combined reach of say five six seven twenty thirty forty people will be much more significant um, than your than your company profile independently. So I think empowering the team, as you said, and working with them to to really kind of grow that profile is important. But then thinking about almost the standards, the branding that you need to consider around the posting that they do. And then the virtual interactions that they have to make sure that actually when they do interact with potential customers, clients, et cetera, that they're doing it in a way that will benefit the business and, and give you a better chance of um, winning out over your competition. And, you know, if you've got um, your competition, a sloppy dress, poor quality lighting, cameras, and, you know, their mic doesn't work, that's, you know, versus somebody that's going to have a really good um, virtual setup, you know, you're probably, you may not win it. Because it obviously is not just down to that, but it is again, it's another tick in your favor. And again, you know, most things in um, in the world and are, are just the kind of the marginal gains. It's like you don't, you know, you're not a hundred percent better than anyone else, but you might be three or four percent. But that's the that's the difference between winning and losing. So I think it's those percentages that we can look to try to to improve and modify to give us a better chance of succeeding in a virtual space. Mm. So some, just something I'm curious to ask you then, um, you t- you've talked about social platforms and uh, I, I'm well aware having sort of embarked on this journey this year with my own sort of personal brand and posting on social, do you have a, a, a platform of choice that you think is a, is a good one to start with? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, it, it, it's always down to, you know, again, the classic answer for this one is always it depends on your customers and your clients in terms of what's their, their preferred social channel so it, you know there's a you can have your personal favorites but it, it's always got to be driven in the marketing space like any marketing decision is, is about 
what your customer's behavior is, where do they go, what do they do, and that, that should then dictate your decision making around um, what you do. I think, you know, broadly speaking, um, in, in the B2B space, uh, LinkedIn has come on uh, leaps and bounds, mm. I think, in terms of its um, over the last, over the pandemic, it's very much seen a, a kind of a massive uptick in, in kind of usage um, statistics because, um, you know, they've updated, constantly updating their, their kind of platform, their algorithm. There's obviously more video content. They've got the live facility that, you know, they, they've kind of moved to more of a, um, a standard social media net. You know, social sort of platform compared to where it was in the beginning, which was obviously just about recruitment. So they've moved mm. quite far away from that as one, one small feature of the overall kind of LinkedIn proposition. So I think if you're in the B2B space, LinkedIn is, is certainly something to um, invest time in. And, and I do it at the talk. I'm just trying to remember the statistics off the top of my head, but it's something like um, there's 900 billion impressions of content um, on the platform, but it's only that 9 billion comes from something like 1% of the user base. Wow. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, the, although there's a lot of people on the platform and consuming and seeing that content, um, I think those statistics are right. <laughs> I need to double check them. <laughs> um, sounds a lot. Um, but, you know, it is the point being is that it's, it's not um, utilized to its full capacity by the large percentage of, of users that are, are on the platform. So there's definitely opportunity um, to do more on that platform. Um, so I'd say that's the B2B kind of proposition. And again, sort of in the B2C space, you, you, you know, again, broadly speaking, because it, it will depend on, on your kind of proposition, but, you know, obviously Facebook and Insta, are, are the sort of uh, Instagram are, um, platforms that are, are used quite heavily, particularly for the visual based products that are out there. Um, and so those, those are the kind of the, the broad ones. And, and those ones are obviously still doing, doing very well. And, and, you know, Eve, Talking, obviously, I've highlighted LinkedIn's increased kind of usage, but um, during the initial stages of the pandemic in kind of March and April, there was a 45% increase in usage of social media because, you know, what are we all going to do? <laughs> we yeah, can't do yeah. much else. Um, and I think, again, you know, <laughs> there's a good chance that that, you know, that, that usage rate will not necessarily stay at those levels, but at the same time, it's probably, it's escalated the trends for those that weren't using it um either much or at all that now are because they've you know because they've experienced it so i think it's you know it's it's moved that trend line a little bit further forward and so you know there's i think social is a very very important channel um and will be for the next um for 2021 um where we're going to have to keep on focusing on that personal branding talking about authenticity thinking about health and safety all of which is um you know is really important that you put on social media because those will be the you know those will be the interactions that people will be uh, kind of really caring about so you've got you're going to make sure that you're doing a good job to ensure that you're you're you know putting all that content on your social channels and, and making sure people see that you're doing some really good stuff and you know valuable things for your customers you know your clients and your team to to, to be that business that is you know um authentic and, and giving back to their, their teams i think you're mm. a statistic about uh one percent probably that doesn't uh, surprise me actually if it's mm. true. Um, I certainly know that probably one of the the areas that my team worked on quite a lot was just having confidence to just pull content from what are the day to day problems that we're solving for our customers, what are our experiences, and sharing those uh, and using video um, to to record those to send them out. Um, they didn't have to be completely polished, but uh, I think there's a definitely I've seen more. Uh, it's still sort of at the sort of um, early stages, but I've seen more and more video content and you mm. look at things like TikTok, for example, uh, which the younger generation are consuming. Um, so I think that definitely, and then when my, if I look at my husband, when he wants content, he goes to YouTube, actually. he Everything mm. he YouTubes. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's becoming quite important. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. I mean, YouTube's the second largest search engine in the world, so it's, it's you know behind Google. So it's it's so so important to have um, have content out there. And as you said, I, you know, I talk about kind of virtually perfect. Obviously, it, you know, it it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. It's just what can you do that gives you a smaller you know a small gain and advantage, and that you know it doesn't have to be studio quality because it you know it's unlikely that the it's even going to be possible with with bandwidths that we have. So you know, it's about just making a positive impression and 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 getting it and as, and just giving it a go because it's like there's not much that you can you know really do wrong. Just 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 kind of give it a go, and I think you then iterate from there. You improve and and kind of it gets better and better each week, and as you try new things, and and that's I think the key to success is 
you know, we, I'm talking about this from, you know, sort of eight months of, of apps of doing live content. So I do a, um, the Business As Unusual show, which is a, a live show that we push out on LinkedIn every Wednesday at 4.30. Originally, it was twice a week and Friday at 4.30 as well. And it started off as a, as a Google Hangout that we, that we just posted um, and people joined and kind of got involved. It was, it was a bit crazy to start with. And then gradually, as we, as we kind of improved our knowledge of, of the technology, um, it's moved to um, a thing called OBS, which is open broadcast software. Um, you know, we've got games, we've got, uh, pe- you know, lots of, lots of interaction points and it's broadcast on YouTube, on LinkedIn. So, you know, it, it started off very, very simply and it's just evolved as we've got better and, and I hope, you know, I hope say better, hopefully better. Um, and to the point where it's, you know, it's, it's quite a, I think a pretty professional production um, quality. So I think you know it's about that first step and making that first step and and trying trying it out. Work you know working on things and that that are great. And if it fails, it fails and move on. And I think that's that's the, I think the challenge that people face and um, that fear of failure, that fear of of getting it wrong, which I can understand. Um, and I think that's where where employees employers sorry have to provide guidance support empowerment so that actually it's like you know don't worry about it you know give it a go and actually that's sometimes enough to get people to try it because they're worried about saying something wrong in a in a social platform or they're worried that the company's going to come down on them if they say something wrong so i think it's it's you know it's empowering them to do that and um and, and you know giving it a go accepting it won't all be perfect um and then improving it as as you go that sounds great so um there's some, there's some um some good tips in there, I guess, around picking up your broadcast that, that goes out weekly and and, and uh, regularly tuning into that to see uh, what, what new ideas you're bringing out to market, I guess. Um, so moving back to sort of more um, general marketing, um, I guess I'd be keen to understand um, what your view around sort of partnerships is. So my, my role is very much around working with partners and we do get a lot of our new business from referrals from our partners. So I'd be keen to understand uh, if that's something that you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it depends on your kind of view, but my, my view has always been is that we, we're great at the things that we do. And if we're not great at it, then we don't do it. Because if you if you try to kind of do something out of your area of expertise, I think you're found out pretty quickly. Um, and I think way back when to, um, you know, when we tried to build websites, right? But like, I think this is year two or three. We're like, yeah, no, we could do that. Um, and, and yeah, and they were, they were, okay but they weren't they weren't great they were all right i and I, I built them myself and um that in itself is dangerous straight away you know that there's a problem if i'm getting involved with that sort of stuff um but they, you know they were functional they did the job and the, and the you know the, the clients were happy but they the over delivery the time it took was just ridiculous and it was you know it took took me away from something i should be doing i should be doing something else definitely and you know it took us away from our, our kind of core and so i think that you know, when it, I, I think that what we've sort of subsequently learned from uh, that early lesson is that, you know, stick to what you're really good at. And if there's a book by Jim Collins and it's called The Hedgehog Concept, and it's about doing what you're brilliant at and, you know, what you can be world class at. And if you can, if you can focus on that, that's, that's how you win in the sort of the, the long game. And I think what, what is important about the partner network is that we, we've got a similar um, a p- network of, uh, partners that we that we operate with, where they're either in a different um, geography. So we we have um, we're part of what's called the DAL Initiative, which is a a, U- a group of European agencies um, that essentially have you know shared learnings, best practices uh, across borders, which is which is fantastic. Um, I think that's going to be potentially very useful in the coming months with uh, with obviously the uh, the B word, the Brexit on the uh, horizon. That that might be something that can we can look to sort of tap into for our, our client network um as well um but also working with with other businesses and partners that that provide a service that sits outside of our core expertise and i think when we when we get a client request which is can you do this you know we don't we don't go oh yeah no we can try that um you know we go no we, we can't do that um yeah. but we've got three people who are brilliant at that have a chat and and i think that you know that leaves you know that that means that we have a great relationship with that client because we're not trying to pretend to do something that we can't we can um introduce some some potentially great partners that we've worked with in the past and 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 hopefully you know everybody has a better experience and you know yes we lose that revenue but 
I don't, I don't think we do. I think it, you know, it's short term revenue for long, um, for long term losses because you, you spend your time doing something that you shouldn't do. You may not have a great end experience. You may lose that client's other bit of work that you've been doing. Um, or we waste your time doing something that that um, that you shouldn't be doing and should be spending your time on other things that might be more valuable. So, a partner networks massively important, I think, for for businesses and particularly in the time of pandemic, it's been it's been really nice to be able to to have those networks to then either pick up those inbounds from from them or support them and and send you know requests their way as well, which has been which has been great. Has that happened with your customer base? Where maybe I don't know, a hotel chain might be promoting themselves through. A local restaurant or other local, you could say, attractions. Is, have you seen that much, or does it partnering tend to hap- happen more at a sort of level where organisations might have some close connections internally and and look to promote each other? How, how have you seen that working? So predominantly, we we get requests where someone says, um, we, you know, we're looking to build a new website, but we're not quite sure which way to go. Um, do you know anybody that can help? And so, you know, that that's kind of probably. 60% of the conversations that we have is generally that. And, and as I said, we don't, <laughs> just to be clear, we do not build websites anymore um, because we're not great at it and it's not something that we're, we're sort of interested in in doing. So so it's generally, it's, it's kind of those sorts of requests. But to be honest, we, we have had, you know, clients that get in contact looking for very, um, you know, obscure requests and, and, you know, and it might not be then our partner network. It might be that actually we have to then send it to our team and they're going, and, you know, they may know, someone that knows someone that knows someone, you know, and it's that kind of trying to look at how we can help support people. And I think, we, you know, we're strong believers in kind of reciprocity, trying to help people as much as we can, because I think it comes back, you know, full circle on, on you know, yourself. If you, if you kind of help enough people get what they want, then you can get what you want in life. And that's a quote from Zig Ziglar, one of my favorites. But, you know, it's, it's I think it's, you know, generally it's, it's the more about the technical things, how we can kind of they need this, but at the same time, is that you know we, we try to just try to link people up because I think if you can if you can do that 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 um you know hopefully helps them to um, put you in the contact with someone else who's asking about paid search SEO or social media in, in the future. Never has there been more uh, an important time for trust to be mm. um in sort of really important for our business and other businesses and um I know that during the pandemic, for example, my 16 year old son would be looking through websites and he'd be saying oh mum we can't go there they haven't got this on trust pilot or they uh, look at their reviews and, mm. and uh, what's your advice about how organizations can build up that trust through being virtually perfect through other marketing initiatives that they're doing yeah absolutely trust is 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 fundamental and it's um i think the the interesting thing at the moment um and again one of the talks that we do which is around um what we call marketing in the new world so one, one of the points that we talk about in that one of the things that you need to con- consider is around trust and reviews and it kind of goes again back to sort of to a degree uh, the health and safety aspect of of the world that we live in um you know we didn't you know to go to book a hotel or to go and have a haircut we didn't have to worry about health and safety so much you know a little bit but not not to the levels that we do right now um and so it's really really important that you kind of build that um, that trust, and I think the the sort of general advice I would say for for people is that they might have, say, you know, sixty, seventy, whatever number of reviews that they've got that are all great. But if they're pre pandemic, so if they don't reference what's been happening in the last sort of two three months, particularly, then they're not going to give um, the the kind of the the user that or the viewer that real confidence that they need. So I think it's you know it's about ensuring that you have relevant timely reviews. Because that will be the thing that will um, really, you know, empower your son, yourself to to kind of go, yeah, actually, kind of, they're taking care of us if we go there. Because I think, you know, pre pandemic it, it's a different world, isn't it? So you know, talking about all the bits that are really important then aren't the bits that are really important right now. So I think having recent reviews is extremely, extremely important. And in terms of getting reviews, I think you know you've just got to ask. I think it, uh, fundamentally it takes. A bit of effort on on the business owner's side because you know we're all i think i think it's, it's it's seven times more likely to leave a bad review than a good review so it's mm-hmm. like you know it, i think we, it's if you do a great job it's like that's kind of expected so i think it's the case of you have to ask you have to say look would you mind reviewing me on google would you mind reviewing me on TripAdvisor? and making it a bit easier for your customers whether that's face to face whether that's uh, via email whether that's via social media whatever it might be but I think it's important to ask and to encourage that 
um, that review process to happen, particularly so that you can address any people's concerns. And I had this conversation with my uh, my barber actually, um, and he, uh, you know, went in, and it was a case of you know he. I was I checked his I checked his what did I check I checked his website his social and there was nothing really that told me whether he was doing anything differently to how it was run before um, and and so then I was like well I don't know if, do I do do I go down there do I hang around outside do I need a mask or not need a mask like what do I need I don't need, you know have they got what are they doing to try and help me as a customer know that it's it's okay you know I strolled down there and went in. And they've got all the stuff there. They've got the hand sanitizer. They've got kind of loads of divides put up. They're all wearing kind of full face PPE. And it, and it's like, oh, okay, they, they really have got it covered off. But nothing existed on his website or um, on his social media profile to tell me that. And, you know, I, I was like, I walked down there because it's not too far from my house. But there'd be a note, there'd be lots of people that won't have done that, that they would have looked on those profiles and they wouldn't have bothered calling because they don't want to call. And they wouldn't have bothered turning up because they didn't want to check it out and they didn't want to take the risk or go out their, their way to kind of find that information out. So, you know, it's not, as I said, it's not health and safety and, um, you know, having those, those reviews and those, those bits there are so, so important more than ever right now because of the world that we're faced with where we, are, where we have health and safety concerns for basic, basic things that used to be a given that are now um, fraught with hypothetical potential danger you know and obviously um you know for people some people it's, it's a high risk there you know it's very very important that it's um that it's you know that we provide them with security that they know that they're going to be be treated well so i've been talking to business advising them as much as i possibly can to, to get those reviews to get recent reviews that show that you're dealing with it um and just to conclude my barber story i then went onto his um google um, reviews page and wrote a review making sure i highlighted all the things that he was doing to make his customers feel safe um in that situation oh that's great <laughs> so i guess leading on from that then there's there's obviously the prediction around health and safety which is really interesting because i hadn't comprehended that myself but now you've mentioned it it's, it's key going forward so what other predictions do you see uh going forward then for for marketing and, and for the work that you do yeah absolutely so um <clears throat> i mean so the other the other sort of just to finalize or or to top up on the the health and safety aspect is it is thinking about things like um the search terms that people use. So when, um, so obviously, as a, as an agency, we focus on um, trying to ensure that our clients will get traffic for um, for, for relevant searches. And, and one of the things that we've we've spotted generally is that the the way that people behave online has changed. So the search habits have, have changed, and what used to work for a client, so certain keywords that used to work may not work currently or in the future. So that's the first thing to say that behaviors have changed. And, and what sort of things that we are seeing is is that the people are, you know, sim- as a simple example, are tagging on things like COVID friendly. So if you're looking at event space, it's like, co- you, would, you know, previously you type in event space and you might be ranking first, you know, first position for that on, um, on Google, which is great. You get loads of traffic, but then suddenly no one searches for that anymore because they now search for COVID friendly event space. And so suddenly you've got to then look at how those behavioral changes will impact the way that people search. And so you've got to think about what that means for your business. And there will be variations pretty much for most businesses out there. Um, so that those beha- think about the behavioral changes and then think about what impact that's going to have and then what you need to change in order to kind of meet those new needs that are faced. And I think that that will carry forward as well. So search habits will change because we've been doing it for such a long time now that we will have certainly quite some time into the future different search habits we'll search for more things we'll search for different search terms that we used before we'll probably ask more questions than we did in the past so it's thinking about you know your your search engine optimization your paid search thinking about what those new questions might be and making sure that those answers um, to those questions exist on your website and again this has always been the case for search it's really really important and that's always been something i would promote prior to covid but just think about now what COVID has done to the questions that people have asked uh, will be asking, and I think you can you can collect that information from your interactions with your your clients. You can collect that information from surveys, from the search data that you might have already. So the so the information exists; it's out there, and and you can kind of look in Google Trends as well to find all those informa- pieces of information out to then allow you to then adapt, update and adapt your your search search marketing strategy to meet those. Uh, needs of the customers in the current world or uh, the new world in the future. So I think that is something 
um, is really important that, that businesses do. I think we obviously we've touched upon health and safety. So again, making sure that the reviews and, and the kind of health and safety um, aspects there. And and the personal branding is is the three. Those are the kind of the three things that we um, sort of talk about as the most important things to consider. Because again, a lot, for a lot of people, people are reluctant to do that personal branding. But you know, you, you're going to have to to it to a degree invest in that. I think in the um, in the new world because that's you know people want to see have that personal experience and 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 see that you're kind of dealing with it. So I think it's those kind of three um, points. Inside those points, there's, there's also the video piece as well, really focusing on, on video, um, broadly speaking. And obviously, I would say this because I run a digital marketing agency, people are going to be online more. So therefore, um, investing in your digital marketing, um, you know, that, uh, as I said, I totally would obviously say that. But, it, but it's, um, you know, we're seeing more people use digital channels um, than ever before, because obviously, um, a lot of people aren't able to, to transact in, in the kind of the real world as much as they, they used to. So I think investing time and effort thinking about your digital strategy is really going to be important for 2021 um because it's, it's escalated those trends um the high street particularly um challenging as as well we you know we've, we've run events called save the high street which is all about how we teach the high street owners to up their digital game so you know people will still shop but their way they shop will change and so thinking about how they can have a um a blended real world and digital strategy in order to try to maximize um, their marketing efforts. And so just making sure that, that businesses are preparing themselves for, t- for 2021, doing more in the digital space, thinking about health and safety, thinking about um, it, you know, their search traffic in terms of the, the way that will have changed and that personal branding. And I think that those are the things I would be focusing on um, certainly into next year. So you talked about um, just making sure that you're staying relevant, I guess, in marketing. Being relevant to customers is always, uh, any time, really important. There's nothing worse than, you could say, uh, having a database and spamming everyone with the same yeah. message <laughs> yeah. all the time. Um, and I think that uh, when you have a, a good marketing um, tool, uh, like the ones that we work with, like Dynamics and uh, Clip Dimensions, uh, you can start to sort of build up a, a picture of uh, your uh, sort of target audiences. I think during this time um, of this of the recession that's happening at the moment, have you seen a, a shift in how organisations are directing their investments in marketing? Um, and how do you see that as we come out of the recession into next year? Yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah. So as an agency, we, we don't work in a particular sector. So we're, we're kind of um, multi-sector. Um, and so what we've seen is we've seen some sectors that um, have literally fallen off a cliff, um, particularly travel. Um, you know, almost there's a line in, in, the, in, the, <laughs> in the analytics where, you know, lockdown happens and, and it just disappears, you know. And, and obviously there's, there's, you know, most people will go, you know, know the, know the kind of the rules if you keep on investing in marketing you're going to come out stronger at the other end and that's all well and good but if you don't have the budget that's not possible so there has been just a scenario for a select you know a selection of our clients in certain sectors where they're just like look we do not have any money coming in right now and although we want to continue we can't so they've had to sort of relook at what they're doing uh, reinvent pivot you know those buzzwords flying around um, and it'll, in order to try to look at how they how they kind of get through it and how they survive, so you know that has obviously impacted a, a number of different businesses. Some of those are going to come out absolutely fine as as the market comes back. Some of them, um, you know, will will potentially not because actually the world will have changed and that that service offering or that proposition may not be relevant and needed in the new world. And that and that's going to be the case for a lot of businesses and a lot of a lot of change. And it's going to be quite. I think quite a tumultuous start to the year next year, particularly Q1, Q2, uh, Q2 where um, where we potentially see the, obviously the government support dropping off from a furlough perspective, and actually those businesses that are currently working and, and sort of to a degree being um, artificially support artificially profitable, artificially supported by the government will have that funding removed, and suddenly you then have a, a potentially a, a scenario where they they drop off, they go under, um, and and it, you know, it's going to be really, really tough for a lot of those businesses and, and obviously the, the people that work for them. What will then happen is there'll be a redistribution of that workforce where those, those employees were um, working for one company that wasn't doing so well, then go to a new company that is doing really well. So obviously, 
you know, delivery comp- companies being an example of that. You know, that the delivery market is obviously booming, um, and it will obviously continue to boom because it's kind of escalated that um, that trend again. So I think there's going to be a tumultuous start to kind of next year. The other side of our clients, we've seen some clients that are either not affected or positively impacted. So um, they, you know, they're looking at how they then redistribute their marketing funds. How can they? Um, you know, make hay while sun shines. So it's how do you how do you kind of really maximize that peak that they're that they're currently seeing? So it's it's a really interesting one looking at the data. And and as an agency, we we know that works in different sectors, we get to see all of these different trends and all these different sectors and how they're kind of behaving and performing. You know, and it's it's really it's really ups and downs. There's some clients, as I say, loving life, and some that are really really struggling. It's it's very difficult. So I think I think it's got to be. You know, people will be looking at how they reinvest their their marketing as we as we move into next year because I think there's still some unknowns in there. Unfortunately, I think um, you know we're going to reach the Christmas break. We're all going to be like, oh god, I'm done with 2020. That was done. You know, and then we're going to have a rude awakening in January. It was like, oh my god, it's more of the same because you know we're not through this yet. We we can't can't quite um we can't quite kind of run out into the streets of you know jump for joy or the rest of it just yet you know it's it's kind of it feels more positive but at the same time it's also uh, feels like there's more more to be done um and we've got brexit in there as well so we've got some real big uncertainties and and i think that you know we're gonna probably see people being a little bit cautious but you know the businesses that are going to be looking at um uh you know q3 q4 of next year thinking actually things will look start looking better might start investing in Q1 and Q2 because they're kind of going, you know what, I think the end of the year is going to be really good. So I'm going to invest kind of now. So I think it's going to be those businesses that firstly have the cash reserves and have got, um, you know, the bravery there or, you know, or they've just been doing really well because of the pandemic anyway. And those are the ones that are going to really go for it in sort of January and February and March and, and then into Q2 ready to sort of hopefully see that, that um, really positive market swing in, in kind of Q3 and Q4. And the, and the reason I think it's you know going to be quite a strong end to next year is because this isn't really like a recession that we've ever seen before, where you know we've 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 essentially been providing people money even if they're not working as a government. The government's been providing money to people, saying even if you're on furlough, you know you're generally you know hopefully doing all right because actually your your cost cost might be lower because you're not travelling potentially and i'm not i'm speaking broadly here i know yep. this is not the same for everybody i've definitely heard that in some cases yeah mm, yeah and so people might finish this year in a better position than they would have done in the previous year even if they haven't had a job because they've been supported by the furlough scheme and um you know as long as their employees or employers have sorted them out with that um and and so actually what we hopefully will see is that as and when the restrictions are loosened opened up we then have people with money um, able to spend it, whereas previous recessions have not been that. They've obviously, you know, mm-hmm. people didn't have money and couldn't spend it, so it's taken, t- you know, it's taken longer to um, to see that kind of uptick in in kind of spending. Whereas we might see that this then suddenly, you know, the shackles are off and people are out and about. And you know, assuming the vaccine works as planned, assuming um, Brexit has some form of sort of positive outcome, then we should hopefully see a really strong end to next year. So I, I think people in, in marketing departments need to look at their investment and spending in certainly, you know, Q2 definitely to make sure that they've got, you know, things in place ready to, um, to, to see that kind of hopefully really strong spending in, in the, the latter part of next year. So if you're a business who perhaps has never done any marketing, but like maybe you've furloughed some of your sales team, you mm. never had a marketing team, and you're looking to come back into the new year and you're looking to build your pipeline and, and start with marketing afresh with this optimism, which I uh, love and, and feel from you. So what, would, what should they be doing, whether they're on a sort of low budget or looking to invest more? What would be your top tips for a business owner looking to get into marketing for the first time? What should they be where should they be looking to invest their money? Yeah, I mean, it is it is a sort of um, it goes back to the classic, you know, what what who's your customers, what they do, and all that. And I'd I'd go to town on asking loads of questions before I'd answer that one. But broadly speaking, I think um, you know, as I said, the, the digital space is is really going to be important. I suspect for for a large percentage of businesses, and you know, I, I you know, I would never say not to do traditional marketing because I do I do think it's important to do that. But if I if I had a limited budget and I could, you know, sort of start with um, with one thing, you know, I would probably be looking at 
um, an element of paid search. If you're if you need if you need to get your um, your business out there quickly, and you're looking for a, a kind of traffic to the website more quickly, that obviously you pay for, you pay for the privilege of doing that, and that kind of gets you gets you there. Um, and it's quite it's, it's again it's it's there's so many questions that relate to that but the, you know the idea of, of search and paid search is that if someone needs something if someone wants something they look onto google and they search for it so they're an active customer so they're looking to solve that problem um or or you know answer that question or, or whatever it might be and so paid search seo are fantastic platforms because you're likely to have people who almost a self-qualifying because they're asking those questions and they te- they're telling you that they need it so if you can be there to provide that answer provide that solution um you're you're kind of getting them in probably sort of mid to the bottom of funnel so we're talking about what you know closer to the point of conversion social media is really important as well that'd be you know something the next thing i'll do if you're very if you're new to um to to the business if you're trying to launch a new product if you no one knows that you exist so if, if you're kind of completely new then social media is very very important because that is what's called the the sort of the, the top part of the funnel that's the awareness act you know area there so you've got to really put yourself on people's radar and social media is a fantastic way to do that um but just note that that is the top of the funnel and it's further away from the point of conversion at the bottom so you've got to try to then your strategy shouldn't be conversion it should be how do i move them down to the next stage of the funnel so i think if you're if you're a new business i would be looking at social media and awareness really focusing on that stage of the funnel if you're more established if you've been around people know that you exist and you know they you know they they uh, you've identified a specific need that they look for online. You know, it's thinking about your so, uh, your your search, whether that's SEO or PPC. I think those are probably um, how I would simplistically try to divide those two different markets there in terms of new businesses to um, that, that that essentially nobody knows they exist versus businesses that are a little bit more established looking to make um, more of their marketing. Brilliant advice, thank you. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and obviously appreciate if you, you had more time, there would be a lot more questions in there and uh, you don't want to dive into the detail, I'm sure. So um, we've we've had a lot of really good um, ideas and, and your predictions for the future today. Um, so uh, following on from that, what, what would be your, your recommendations in terms of books they should be reading this about Ooh. their business or ideas for what they should be doing next year? Oh, that's a good question like that. Um, so I, I mean, there's a book called uh, I've referenced it already, which is um, Good to Great by Jim Collins. I think that's a fantastic book. Um, and I think there's some really good messages in there, which are very, very uh, relevant right now with the, with the pandemic. So I think that is, um, and, and, you know, and almost like the world that we've, that we've kind of um, been living in right now. So I think that would be something I would definitely recommend. I would also look at um, Rich Dad, Poor, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, one of my favorites. Love that one. Um, and to be honest with you, I would just try and buy them something motivational right now because this year has been a challenge. So mm. I think it's like trying to keep it, um, keep it motivational and keep it kind of like, let's keep going. Because I think we need to all, you know, and we should all just take stock of the year that we've had. What have we learned about ourselves? What have we learned? Uh, what do we like about what, what we, how we've reacted? What do we not like? What do we can do better? How can we improve? It's a great time to, to kind of consolidate, or, or, you know, everything that's kind of gone through you know what we've all kind of been dealing with and going through this year but i also think we've got to be very careful that we don't have this mindset of that's done really not much will have changed in terms of actually where we are there's still the hope there's still the focus on the on the vaccine which is great and we're rolling that out which is really really exciting but we've just got to keep that kind of that um that mindset of um you know keeping on keeping our focus on um you know on the next right thing to do rather than um you know, relaxing and going, it's all done because it isn't. We're not through this and we're going to have Brexit. We're going to have some other stuff in there. So I think book-wise, motivational, positive and keep them reinventing their business as we enter in this mad, mad new world that we're going to live in. What? Yeah, sounds like good advice. Yeah, fantastic advice. Uh, maybe maybe a gratitude and reflections journal would be, mm. would be good then. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think... Um, We've got uh, um, in the office <laughs> when when we're allowed in there. Uh, we have um, a gratitude wall, so um, and we get we got the team last year in January, um, and we, we're doing something in in January as well, which is um, based around uh, Blue Monday, which is I think the 18th of January this year, which is essentially supposed to be the most depressing day of the year mm-hmm. um, statistically because of something to do with the furthest away from the holiday 
all of your credit card bills are due, all that sort of stuff. So it's apparently that we turn that into what we call Purple Week, where we focus on loads of things that people can do to kind of build that um that kind of resilience that kind of mental health aspect and and last year we did uh the wall of gratitude where everyone had to write or didn't have to they could choose to write something um that, that they were really grateful for and i think yeah that's a really really good idea i think book wise writing a journal um of things that you should be really grateful for and you know i hope i hope that you know i know it's really tough for some people but i really hope that this year there are lots and lots of things to be you know, really grateful for as well as all the challenges as well. But actually, there should be hopefully some really things that we can look back on and go, you know what, actually, that was that was brilliant. And that brought me closer to my family or, or to my colleagues or to, to whoever, which is something hopefully that we get to carry forward and, and, um, and remember for the future. Yeah, I'm sure there's be a lot of reflection that people will have done or changed careers or realized they went in the right place or with the right person. There's probably lots of that and, and nothing like slowing down time uh to help us think mm. about things that we really want that make us happy well luke it's been absolutely wonderful um chatting with you today and thanks for sharing all your fantastic insight uh and for your ongoing help with uh, with our own project and for anyone listening that would like to hear more about future podcasts coming up you can go to www.cloud9insight.com forward slash podcasts so goodbye for now and see you next time thanks very much goodbye Thanks, everyone.